I am an AI researcher, but um, I, I don't believe that AI or intelligence is an individual property. I, I think that it's collective. Uh, I think that it's something that uh, comes about through evolution and through culture, uh, and that that has been uh, happening uh, in, in particular. Human uh, intelligence has really been a product of 10,000 years of, of evolution. And uh, the fact that we are now doing it with, uh, with computers is really just uh, another step in a, in a process that, that began when the glaciers retreated. Now, um, in 2016, uh, so a number of years ago now, my, um, my friend and fellow Seattleite, uh, Dan Savage, had me on his Sex Advice podcast uh, uh, to talk about um, the coming of the sex bots, and I, I foolishly accepted. Um, <laughs> And, um, uh, and, you know, Westworld was coming out. It was, you know, I guess one of the, one of the first sort of uh, markers of the, uh, of the sort of AI cultural moment. And um, uh, so, you know, we, we talked about, about sex bots for a little while. Uh, and um, I, I also had just started around that time a side project doing, uh, doing these uh, data science surveys. Uh, that uh, involved asking lots of people, tens of thousands of Americans, about their identities. And uh, it turns out that, um, well, my data showed that people were starting to really polarize in an extraordinary way. Uh, it was, uh, a, I guess, a, 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 either a, a prescient finding or a late finding, because the day that I was in the podcast studio was November 8th, and uh, the polarization of, um, of American society was going to be really revealed uh, that, that very evening when, uh, when the polls returned and, and Donald Trump was elected. So um, we were splitting apart uh, in, in various ways. Uh, and uh, so over the next couple of years, I continued to do these uh, surveys and try and explore uh, human collective identity in more detail. Uh, at times, that intersected with my work on AI. And um, so I went back on the podcast a couple of years later, actually, to talk about uh, how sexual identity and AI intersected, and we, you know, I just published uh, with a couple of uh, co-authors, Alex Todorov and Margaret Mitchell, uh, this piece uh, debunking uh, a piece of AI research that had come out of Stanford uh, that claimed that you could recognize a person's sexual orientation from a selfie. Uh, it turned out to be bad science. Uh, and you can kind of see uh, what was up by just looking at the facial composites of the straight man and woman and the gay man and woman, uh, and I'll just go back for a moment. And you might note that there, there are some makeup and eyeshadow type differences that the AI might be pick up on, picking up on, but the most funny difference is that you'll notice that the straight guy, so a lot of these photos were from OkCupid, okay and the straight guy shoots from below, and therefore it makes his chin look more, you know, like bigger and more manly and smaller forehead. And if you're gay, you know that shooting from above makes you look better. Uh, and um, <laughs> as this is, a, you know, this is probably what the AI was picking up on. Uh, that's good news for, uh, for a lot of people, uh, given that um, you know, there are still countries where, of course, uh, being gay is, is illegal and is punishable by death, and so it wouldn't be great if that, that stuff could be detected from, uh, from CCTV footage. Now, five years later, uh, all of my results from these uh, you know, sort of six years of running surveys are now uh, up on whoarewenow.net, and I published them in a book. And I want to give you a little bit of a whirlwind tour of some of the, um, some of the interesting findings that, that came out of this, because I, I was really continually surprised uh, and sometimes shocked by, by the things that I discovered. So I'll just give you a whirlwind tour of a few of those things. Now, um, I want to just begin with an observation about scaling laws. So in AI, we talk quite a lot about scaling laws uh, nowadays and how as you get bigger and bigger models, you get smarter and smarter uh, forms of intelligence. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, uh, I believe that that intelligence is fundamentally human, and the human scaling law began when we began reproducing exponentially, uh, uh, when, the, when the glaciers retreated, and especially when farming began to really take off and technologies began to take off, and we began to essentially escape planet Darwin. We began to, to become exponential reproducers. Uh, and this led to a kind of panic when people began to realize that humans were proliferating exponentially. That happened almost at the same time in the West with, uh, with Thomas Malthus and in China uh, by Hong Liangji. They made simultaneous discoveries about human exponential growth, and uh, that led to a big panic that we were going to, uh, uh, to end up reproducing until we, uh, until we overran the entire planet. That is not what is happening. 
So um, in, in my survey data, you know, I asked, how many children do you have? And this is a, a breakdown of that by age. And you can see that you know, in the US, um, basically everybody has less than two children. If it weren't for immigration, the country would be shrinking uh, rapidly. And that's happening in all of the economically developed countries. Uh, as a side note, uh, women have a quarter of a child more than men do. Uh, that's, that might surprise you. Uh, men, on average, you have a quarter of a child out there that you don't know about. <laughs> now, um, because, because men tend to be a little older than the women that they marry, um, what, one of the things that we see is that, uh, well, for, for one thing, there are many fewer people uh, married nowadays than there were in the mid-20th century, but also that the rates of marriage diverge a lot uh, as, we look at, as we look at older and older people because uh, not only are men older when they get married, they also tend to die six years younger. Uh, and so uh, suddenly there are many, many fewer married women as we you know, kind of enter into the 80s, and that's because of widowhood, uh, which rises and is not, uh, uh, is not respecting gender equality. So a huge majority of widows by age 84 are women, not men. Um, okay, uh, let's look at, at, um, at homosexuality. So uh, exclusive same-sex attraction among women and men uh, doesn't vary all that much by age. Uh, it's you know, roughly 5%. Uh, so you know, this is a little bit uh, similar to a lot of the statistics that many of us hear about, you know, that, that you know, 5% of people roughly are, are, are gay or lesbian. But um, in recent years, we've seen a real explosion, especially among young people, of various different forms of, of sexual expression, sexual identity. And they are really, really uh, on the rise, especially among the young. So when you look at 19-year-olds, you know, uh, nearly 30% are, uh, are LGBTQ in one form or another, uh, which, are, which are numbers that for a lot of, a lot of older people, like myself, are surprising. Uh, this is also not uh, respecting gender equality. So uh, the number of bisexual women, uh, as we look at the young end of the spectrum, is far, far greater than the number of bisexual men. So bisexual men remain more or less constant at 5% by age. Uh, they outnumbered um, bisexual women by a factor of two uh, in the old days, if you look at 70-year-olds, but bisexual women are vastly more common today than, uh, than bisexual men. Uh, that's the, that's the, the ratio of number, number of bisexual people who are women. So um, gay men, uh, gayness also you know, uh, rises among, among the young, um, and uh, so does lesbianness. But uh, as with bisexuality, uh, lesbian population uh, among, among the young is, is uh, greatly, uh, um, is much, much greater than the number, of, the number of gay men. Being lesbian used to be exotic uh, in, uh, in, you know, among the older generation. If we go back to pulp fiction in the, in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, uh, being, being lesbian was very unusual, but we see that that is absolutely not the case today. Um, and one of the things that this suggests is that there may be a disconnect between the idea of exclusive same-sex attraction and being gay or lesbian. It used to mean that uh, you wouldn't say that you were gay or lesbian unless you were exclusively same-sex attracted. Um, and that is still largely true among gay men. So, you know, uh, roughly four out of five gay men are exclusively same-sex attracted. However, uh, if, you are, uh, if you are lesbian, then uh, the overwhelming likelihood uh, is uh, nowadays that you are not exclusively same-sex attracted, even though that was true of almost all lesbians among the older generation. So there, there are differences in definition that are happening over time as well. Um, gender identification of queer people. Similar story. Uh, queer women, much, much greater. Uh, Non-binariness is growing among younger people, and so they're much more likely to also be, uh, be, be queer and uh, and those are new identities, and you can see that, that, the, that divergence between men and women has really been growing among the young. Now, these things are also changing over time. So I've, I've shown you a bunch of breakdowns by age. If you look at this uh, as a function of time, because I was running these surveys for several years, uh, you can see that even between 2018 and 2019, uh, the number of queer people has risen uh, remarkably, and that's true of all of those, uh, uh, of all of those minority identities. Now, I mentioned non-binariness already, uh, so let's talk about sex and gender a little bit, since this is very much a, a, a culture wars issue. Uh, so uh, there are, these are a whole bunch of questions, like do you use the men's bathroom, do you use the women's bathroom, do you wear a bra, do you wear boxer shorts, do you play shooter video games? 
and there are correlations with uh, are, you, are you male or female, and you can see that there, there are definitely some correlations here. Uh, and the correlations with, with uh, identifying as female look almost exactly uh, the opposite, so that's no surprise. Uh, if you now take the multidimensional space defined by responses to all of those questions, and you, uh, and you see them, you sort of plot them in, in two dimensions, you can see that um, uh, men and women are, um, well, sort of both binary and not binary. So, you know, all of these debates about, you know, is, is, uh, uh, is sex binary, is gender binary, it's more complicated than that. There are two clusters here. Uh, there also are plenty of people in the middle, and many of those people in the middle identify as, as both or neither, uh, male nor female. So, uh, two clusters, um, but, um, uh, but also, but also uh, a continuum in between. That's different from height. Uh, height also, uh, you know, is, is generally sexually dimorphic. Men tend to be taller than women, but actually if you plot the two curves on top of each other, you see that, uh, that they kind of merge in the middle, so it looks like a one-hump camel uh, instead of a two-hump camel. So, uh, you know, this is not the way people usually think about it. People usually think about sex as, as a, as a two-hump camel, uh, but gender as a one-hump camel. It's actually the other way around. Uh, trans identification uh, is a big culture war issues nowadays, and it is going up in a very dramatic way. So from 2018, 19 to 2020, 21, and if I look only at the 2021 data, it's, it's even higher uh, at, at 6%. So this is a very, very significant uh, trend among, among young people. I'll show you one piece of data that, is, that, that really bucks that trend that I found really surprising. This is intersexuality. Unlike everything else which rises sharply among the young, intersexuality is virtually zero at age 19 and then goes up all the way to 2%. If you don't know what intersexuality is, it's too much to, to talk about in the next three minutes, but basically it means that you're born with sex characteristics that are neither strictly male nor strictly female. Uh, and and what, what this shows you is that the vast majority of people are not told uh, when, they, uh, when they are young that, that they're intersex, and they tend to find out when they go to the doctor, maybe with uh, difficulties with fertility or something. And, and so it's hidden. It's something that nobody knows about because it's thought about as medical, unlike being trans, which is thought about as an identity and is much more public. Uh, but, uh, but it's extraordinarily common. It's more common than blonde or red hair. Um, neither is intersexuality um, sort of uh, an equal opportunity player when it comes to assignment uh, as male or female at birth. And you can see here that there's been a very dramatic change in assignment at birth. Uh, it used to be that almost everybody intersex was assigned male at birth, and now almost everybody intersex is assigned female at birth. And uh, that's very interesting because if you look at the same data for trans people, you find the same exact pattern. Um, and, uh, and this is a connection that, to my knowledge, hasn't been made elsewhere, and it's a very tricky and complicated one politically, because, again, if you're trans, that's an identity. If you're intersex, many people think about that as, as medical, as being like diabetes or something, and, uh, and yet the two are likely uh, very closely connected with each other. Uh, and, and this is something that those two communities, uh, I think, you know, have, they have a lot of conversation, let's say, to have with each other about, about that, uh, except among the very, very young, uh, because among the very young, the, the trans identity has come to mean something much broader than, uh, than, uh, than, than what it used to mean. So, uh, you know, people of my age grew up uh, with, you know, uh, the Priscilla Queen of the Desert model for, uh, for what, you know, being, being trans meant, but actually trans looks the other way nowadays. You know, trans people uh, assigned female at birth are greatly outnumbering trans people assigned male at birth. And, uh, and this is a very strong uh, trend uh, that also is distinguishing the city from the countryside. So I want to just show you a couple of quick things about city versus countryside before wrapping up here. Um, the, the, big, um, so the big gravitational collapse of our society has to do with the fact that over the last 10,000 years, people have been gathering in cities, and cities are the places where culture happens. Uh, and, uh, they, and, and they're the places where time, in a sense, speeds up because cultural development is a function of density. So, um, you know, I was able to ask people uh, about uh, their zip code when, when, I, when, I, uh, when, I, when I did these surveys, and based on that, uh, we can find out uh, what, what density uh, of, of environment they live in. Uh, we can see here uh, urbanization in the world since the year 1700. And, um, you know, uh, urban environments have always been seen as dens of iniquity. Uh, they are certainly where all of the interesting culture and the best music happens. Uh, they're also the biggest divider 
of politics by far. So uh, whether you support marriage equality, believe climate change is real, believe in the right to an abortion or an LGBT supporter, uh, those are extraordinarily strong functions of population density. The left here is cities, the right is the countryside, and there is no variable that separates politics anywhere anything like population density does. The opposite is true of believing that white Americans are oppressed, um, that uh, homosexuality is wrong, that uh, Muslim immigration should be banned, uh, or that uh, Sharia law within the US is a threat. And that's especially uh, interesting because, at least in the US, when you look at the actual makeup of people in the, in the countryside, they are all white and native-born. So it's exactly in the places where that diversity doesn't exist that the fear is the greatest. So um, I, I, wanna, um, I wanna wrap up. I know I'm a little bit over time here. Um, and, and just point out that uh, this, the fact that, that progress happens so much faster in, uh, in, in the cities than in the countryside because people are meeting uh, and connecting and, uh, and, and mingling their ideas and, uh, and, and new cultures are being nucleated and that the countryside is emptying out at the same time and becoming more homogenous is probably the single biggest factor in, uh, in, in the uh, in the culture wars, that's, that's what's going on. The, the countryside is emptying out and becoming more conservative at the same time that the cities are becoming denser and, and more progressive. And, uh, and this is a massive problem because this is the very moment in which we actually need to come together as a planet rather than thinking about ourselves as individual reproducers uh, that are doing uh, what, uh, you know, what we've done for most of the last 10,000 years and just fighting against Darwin to reproduce and have enough children to, uh, to get by. So um, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to end there uh, on, on, the, on the planetary note. Uh, we're about to become a planetary uh, civilization. We're already in the Anthropocene, but if we don't uh, figure out a way for the countryside and the city to, uh, to come together, uh, we're going to be in trouble. And, uh, and at the moment, the countryside and the city are so deeply interdependent that, uh, uh, that, that we're, we're not gonna be able to come together as a, as a planet if we don't figure out a way to politically reconcile um, between them. Uh, thank you all so much, uh, and um... 